And now calling the meeting to order. Apologies for the delays from the technical difficulties. Um, it's already that kind of night. So I just want to start off by saying that as moderator, a central part of my job is to moderate, not just in the sense of managing the speaker queue, but in a deeper sense of being a moderating force to cool passions, the saucer that cools the hot tea, so to speak. Frankly, this is the part of the job that I take even more seriously than all the technical aspects of the rules and procedures because it's the flaring of passions that are the greatest threat to our institutions of democracy, not the minutia of whether we're following every last rule precisely to the letter of this rule book. Don't get me wrong, I'm a stickler for rules too. Town meeting is a deliberative legislative body doing the town's official business. When we enter debate, there is no cheering or booing and certainly no intimidation. If those are the things that you came here for, then you're in the wrong place. This is not a public forum. I watched the video of the artificial turf forum that was held here last Tuesday. That is not how this meeting is going to be run. This is a legislative meeting with a strict agenda and it is made available to be viewed by the public. Comments during debate that call into question the intentions or the motivations of others will not be tolerated. When I sit in this chair and the meeting is in session, I am the only person in this chamber with the authority to recognize individuals to speak. We're doing it this, we've been doing it this way for 216 years in this town and we're not going to stop tonight. Later tonight there will be debate about artificial turf fields and as moderator I take no position on that debate. But I definitely take a position on how we conduct that debate. How we conduct ourselves in this meeting tonight will have lasting effects on our democratic institutions and on our community and our town and town meetings ability to translate the will of the people of Arlington into decisions that affect the entire town. When you speak tonight, consider the lasting effects of your words on this institution and on the civic fabric of this town. Think about whether your words and actions reflect the better angels of our nature. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Select Board. Thank you for your wise words. I hope that we all heed them. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 10th, 2023, at 8 p.m. We have a second. Uh, all those in favor of if this meeting uh, adjourns tonight, uh, convening at Wednesday, May 10th, at 8 p.m., say yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Okay, we'll now take a quick test vote. So the test vote is, vote yes if you support free speech for people you disagree with. And yes, your vote will, can and will be used against you in the future by the people who disagree with you. Okay, let's close voting. Oh, very good. Okay. And now Mr. Helmuth will lead us in the national anthem. Please rise.
you. Thank you. Do we have any announcements or resolutions tonight? Mr. Fosco? I believe we have um, some a, a slide to show. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. Uh, I would like to um, ask that um, Mr. Paul Buckley, a resident of Arlington, uh, be allowed to make an announcement. Is that okay? Uh, uh, and, and he is a resident of Arlington, correct? Yes, sir. And he has the right to speak. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and members of the town meeting. I'm sorry, just name and address, please. My name is Paul Buckley, 68 Beacon Street, Precinct 5. Um, I'm, a, I'm the president of Rotary in Arlington, and each year we put up flags. We call them Flags for Heroes. Um, we moved them up to the uh, water tower when the construction on the high school started, and um, we asked people to sponsor these flags for $40 each in which you can honor two people for each flag, which are your heroes. We use the money from these flags to give scholarships to students of Arlington High, Minuteman, and Arlington Catholic. Um, the flags go up a little before Memorial Day, and they stay up through Flag Day, June 14th. Um, it's quite a sight with Boston in the background up at the water tower, so if anybody's interested in sponsoring a flag for $40, through Arlington Rotary. It's ArlingtonMARotary.com. And there's a Flags for Heroes section there. And we appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Marr, do you have an announcement? Uh, thank you, Ms. Moderator. John Marr, Precinct 14. Uh, I appreciate your words, by the way, Ms. Moderator. This is my 48th annual town meeting. I stand here to, uh, as I, in years past, indicate that the Board of Directors of the Simmons Memorial Fund here will be soliciting proposals for a grant or grants to nonprofit entities whose principal function is to provide health-related or health or wellness services to the residents of the Arlington community. The Simmons Memorial Fund is the successor to the medical, Simmons Medical Use Nonprofit Corporation. The latter entity was established pursuant to the voluntary dissolution of Sims Health Services, which had operated the Sims Hospital in Arlington. Certain provisions of the dissolution agreement, as established by the Supreme Judicial Court of the Commonwealth, set aside funds remaining from the hospital's dissolution to be administered by the corporation. Uh, any inquiries uh, regarding grant application materials may be obtained by contacting the chairperson of the corporation, me, uh, by phone or by, I'll be uh, during the break downstairs, or you can find me upstairs in the party room, I mean the uh, satellite room. Uh, we have over the years given over a million dollars worth of grants to such entities as the Boys and Girls Club, Youth Consulting Center, School Department, Food Link, Arlington Housing Authority, Arlington Eats, Visiting Nursing, Association and others. We average about a $50,000 grant uh, per year. So please reach out to me. Uh, in years past, folks from town meeting have come up and it actually generated uh, uh, new grant uh, proposals. So please uh, reach out to me. I'd be glad to talk to you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Do we have any other announcements or resolutions tonight? Uh, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Alan Jones, Precinct 14. Uh, two years ago, town meeting out on the football field overwhelmingly approved Beth Malofchik's uh, article to request the select board to proclaim June 24th Prince Hall Day to commemorate the talk that Prince Hall gave uh, at African Lodge No. 1 in Monotomy on June 24th, 1797. On June 21st, 2021, the select board made that proclamation. To celebrate Prince Hall Day this year, on Saturday, June 24th at 7 p.m. at the Arlington Masonic Temple up the street, the Arlington Historical Society, Arlington's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Division, and Mystic Valley Lodge of Freemasons are hosting a talk by Rosemary Smirzinski on the life and legacy of Prince Hall. Uh, and I hope uh, 
you can all come to that. I'm going to try to talk Eric into doing the walk-in music. Uh, if you would like a uh, souvenir memorial invitation, uh, I have them up front. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, now call for reports of committees. Ms. Deschler. Mr. Moderator, Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. Okay, we have a second to remove Article 3 from the table. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed, no. It is unanimous. Article 3 is now before us. Uh, we're now ready to receive any reports. Yes. Alan Reedy, Precinct 16, and Chair of the Arlington Permanent Town Building Committee. I move that the report of the Building Committee be received. We have a second to receive the report of the Permanent Town Building Committee. Uh, all those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is received. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. So the full report is available um, on the website. I'm going to give an abbreviated report tonight. Um, so the Permanent Town Building Committee was created by town meeting. This is your committee. It was created to oversee major construction renovation projects in the town of Arlington, uh, school additions, police station, fire stations, and, and so on. We have nine members uh, who you can see listed there. Uh, we meet uh, twice a month throughout the year um, to, uh, to work on all these projects. I would like to recognize uh, a couple of members uh, who were Longtime town meeting members, Bob Jefferson and John Marr. Um, I'd also like to recognize uh, Bill Hayner from the school committee, who, uh, after many years of service, is, uh, is stepping down. And I'd like to welcome Paul Schlickman as the new uh, designated representative from the school committee uh, on this important committee. So in the past year, uh, we, we've had two major projects. Could you have the next slide, please? So the Central School, um, otherwise known as the Community Center for Arlington, this is about a $9 million project, um, extensive renovations to the interior. A lot of the renovations you don't see. They're behind the walls, uh, HVAC systems, and, and so on. Uh, but also some significant upgrades to the exterior of the building. Uh, the renovations are on the ground floor, the first floor and the second floor. Some of you re may remember a couple of years ago, a few years ago, the Arlington Center for the Arts moved into the third and fourth floor and, and renovations were accomplished uh, on those floors at that time. Uh, the facility supports a, a number of key uh, departments in town, uh, the Council on Aging, Health and Human Services, Veterans Services. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's about a $9 million project. At this point, the building, building has been occupied for um, close to a year now, and, but we're still in what we call the closeout phase. We're trying to get just the last things done on this project, get all the last documents, make sure everything works, and, uh, and, and, and welcome the public into the building as, as we have now for almost a year. Can we have the next slide, please? So I just thought I'd show you a couple of pictures. Uh, they are worth a thousand words. Uh, on the left side, you see the new front entrance, the new south front entrance on Maple Street. And on the right-hand side, this is the uh, main corridor on the first floor of the building. Uh, next slide. Uh, upper left, uh, a, a very significantly improved uh, kitchen facility. This is on the first floor. Those of you who may have gone into the building before renovations would probably remember the last one, which is about the size of a, uh, of a bathroom. Uh, this is really a full commercial kitchen. Lower left is the new library, which is down on the ground floor. And on the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the accessible lift, which allows people to move from the ground floor to the uh, east entrance and up to the first floor. Uh, next slide. So the second major project is the town, what we're calling the town yard and municipal services. So. This is a, a large project. This is a 47, about a $47 million project. Uh, there are four historic buildings on the site, and we are building a 
a very large and new administrative and maintenance facility on the site. Uh, there was extensive site work, or has been and continues to be extensive site work at this particular location. Uh, when it's done, it will house the Department of Public Works, uh, Inspectional Services, IT, and Facilities Departments. Um, th this is a difficult site. Um, I could spend the rest of the evening or perhaps the rest of the year telling you about all of the issues with this site. Uh, some of you uh, histor history buffs may know that this was the site of a, goal, a, a, a I think it was a coal gasification plant. Um, and as a result of these activities, the site has, uh, there's a lot of hazardous materials there, uh, chromium and so on. We punched, I don't know how many holes in the ground even before construction began to make sure we knew where the problems were. But still, every time a shovel went in the ground, it seemed as though we found something new. Um, anything from a, a pipe that was connected to who knows where to a storage tank that was 50 feet long and contained who knows what. So this, is, this has been a, a very challenging project, continues to be a challenging project. Um, the committee is doing everything it can to uh, deliver this project to the town. Um, I'd say relatively on time. It will be later than the original uh, budget anticipated. And we, we anticipate uh, delivering it as close to budget as possible, but we are very concerned uh, that we're getting into a phase of construction where we're going to be renovating a couple of the oldest buildings on the site, and there are just things that you find that you could not have foreseen, even with a lot of what we call destructive testing uh, before the project has begun. So uh, we, we may be back to talk to you in the future, but we, we're going to do everything we can to stay within the, the budget of this project and uh, give you a, a high-quality site. So let's, let's move on to some pictures. Next slide. So this is a, an overview of the site, the, the large building that you see um, sort of covered in blue in this picture is what we call Building E. This is the new administrative and uh, maintenance facility that fronts on uh, Grove Street. We have about uh, a minute left. Okay. On the, the left-hand side, you see the historic buildings, which we're calling A, B, C, and D, and then the new salt shed. Uh, next slide. Uh, just some other views of this new uh, administrative and maintenance facility, uh, the, the front uh, uh, on Grove Street, and then the large maintenance bays. Next slide. Upper left is the new uh, IT server rooms when it was empty before it was uh, occupied by the servers that moved over from the high school. Lower left, drilling some of those holes. Uh, upper right, uh, a large retaining wall being placed. And then lower right, uh, the salt shed. And then one more slide. And here's the, uh, the topping off ceremony, which took place um, uh, late last summer uh, with uh, Director of Public Works, Mike Rademacher, signing the, uh, the final girder. Um, so uh, we appreciate your support so far for these projects. and. Um, we're going to do our best to, uh, you know, get them done on time and uh, within our budget. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other reports of committees? Seeing none, Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Finance Committee Chair. I uh, move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a second to move article to lay Article Three upon the table. All those in favor, say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimously laid upon the table. Thank you. Uh, we will now take up Article Forty Four first. Ms. Deschler. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move that Articles Thirty through Forty Three be laid upon the table. Second. We have a second to lay Articles Thirty to Forty Three, excluding the ones we've already disposed of, upon the table. All those in favor, say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. Article Forty Four is before us. Ms. Deschler, did you have anything, since this is a finance committee, or is there anything you want to say about the, uh, the vote briefly? Uh, and then I'll invite Mr. Ruderman up to introduce the particulars. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. You will see in the Finance Committee report, Article 43, 44, we are recommending that an appropriation in the amount of $8,932,916 uh, 
be approved for the Minuteman uh, Regional School District. And uh, I will turn it over now to Mr. Rudiman to introduce our uh, guest tonight. Thank you. And as Mr. Rudiman walks up to the podium, can we clear and open the speaker queue, please, so everyone can start from a clean slate? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Desler, and uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Rudiman, Precinct 9. I am also Arlington's representative to the Minuteman School Committee. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, we are a nine-town uh, regional uh, school committee, excuse me, nine-town regional school district. Each of the towns appoints uh, one person to serve on the school committee through its select board or board of selectmen, and I'm proud to have been Arlington's representative these past three years. Uh, you, the report uh, that contains the details in the budget presentation will be displayed for you here tonight. It's also uh, been, been uploaded to, to the town's webpage for reports and should be linked to the annotated warrant. We're trying to save uh, some money uh, <laughs> rather than printing, you know, 1,700, 1,800, maybe 2,000 copies of it to, to distribute to all the town meeting members in, in all the member towns. But we'll follow along right here on the screens. It is my privilege tonight to introduce you for the first time to our new superintendent, new in the sense of never having been before this meeting before, but uh, new, in, new in terms of being in her first year of service, Dr. Kathleen Dawson. Uh, we... Uh, hired uh, her to start at the beginning of this school year. Uh, the school committee was uniformly impressed with her uh, credentials and her experiences. Uh, she uh, did her undergraduate work at the University of Wisconsin, uh, master's at the Ed Scott at Harvard Education, <laughs> Harvard School of Education, and her doctors from the University of Pennsylvania. Her most recent superintendency ex experience comes from North Carolina, but coming back to Massachusetts is something of a homecoming for her as she comes back to her roots. She'll give the uh, initial presentation. I'll be available to answer questions. The two of us will be assisted by the inestimable budget director, Ms. Nikki Andrade, who is also here with us tonight. Uh, I'm sure uh, we'll, be answer, we'll be able to answer uh, among the three of us any questions that you may have. With that, I'm going to turn over uh, to Dr. Kathleen Dawson. Yeah, the, the, the clock is actually not, I, I can see the clock, but the rest of you cannot for some reason, and so we're not going to hold up the meeting on that detail, but I am tracking the time. Uh, Dr. Dawson, welcome to the meeting. Uh, if you need additional time, please request it in advance, and we can ask the meeting. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Thank you so much. And Mr. Ruderman, thank you so much for your kind welcome. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Dr. Kathleen Dawson, and I am the superintendent of Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School District. And tonight, we are here to present a high-level overview of the summary of the fiscal year 2024 budget recommendation for your approval. Next slide. Our budget is grounded in improving teaching and learning for all our students. To support us in accomplishing these goals, Minuteman's FY24 operating and capital budget request overall is up 4.5 percent compared to that of FY23 budget. And on the next slide here are Minuteman's operating expenses, which are up approximately 6%, operating capital consistent at 0.21%, and the capital building project debt is slightly lower in FY24 than in FY23. And this is an important breakout as seven of our nine member towns voted a debt exclusion on the school building project. And on the next slide, you will see our key objectives and drivers of our FY24 budget. And following on the next slide, the total preliminary assessment for Arlington, including the building project debt service that is excluded from Prop 2.5, is approximately $8.9 million. The preliminary assessment for Arlington without the building project debt is approximately $7.1 million. And on the next slide, we're here to show you the comparison of changes in enrollment to the changes in revenue. With the decrease in out-of-district enrollment comes a decrease in revenue from non-member tuition and non-member capital fee, which is set by the state. And on the next slide, you can see from last year to this year the changes in the components of the assessment. Minuteman uses the four-year rolling average of enrollment to determine assessments, as noted in the regional agreement. Arlington's four-year rolling average has increased by 15.7%, compared to the total assessment increasing of 12.4%. 
And on the next slide here, we show the percent change in four-year rolling average of enrollment with the percent change in assessment for all our member towns for your review. And it is important to note that the four-year rolling average will eventually even out over the next few years as enrollment becomes more typical of full freshman classes of member towns. So as presented, it is the shifts in, enro in enrollment that are increasing the assessments for each member town. The increase is paying for more of your students to have access to a choice in the type and quality of career technical education. The increase in enrollment on the next slide is requiring three additional full-time teachers. And being cautious of our budget and assessments impact on our member towns, Minuteman is not requesting funding for all the positions that we would need to provide the standard of service that we would need to meet our expectations. We, of course, as we do always, teachers are step up and we make sure that all of our needs are met, but at bare minimum, we do need three additional full-time teachers. And on the next slide, we know that it's difficult for you to read, but we did want to just share with you that we do not solely rely on our member towns to fund all the district's needs. We work diligently to apply for and receive grant funding and as you can see for FY23, we received an additional $3 million to support our initiatives. And another major driver is OPEB, right? The school committee's responsibility for maintaining the funding for other post-employment benefit liability. This requires a long-term strategy was recommended by our OPEB advisory committee. And currently the fund balance is slightly over $400,000 and we do need to drastically increase our yearly contribution if we are to meet the liability amount of over $20 million. And on the next slide, you'll see that the strategy is to allocate the amount that is currently being allocated to the ESCO lease toward the OPEB payment after the ESCO lease payment ends in FY25. So on the next slide here, you will see the overall budget summary of our operating and capital budget and the breakouts with the total operating and capital budget request increase of 4.5%. And lastly, our overall budget request in comparison to FY23 is less than the prior year's requests in all categories. So in closing, we return to our values, our students and their learning. We recommend the approval of the FY24 budget that will support the needs of our students and their teachers. And we thank you very much for this uh, continued support from Arlington. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Dr. Dawson. Uh, let's see, so let's uh, switch over to the speaker queue. And let's, see, I'll, let's, let's skip to Ms. Mandel, who I don't believe we've heard from yet. Mona Mandel, Precinct 9. Firstly, a warm welcome to you, Dr. Dawson. Um, this is your first town meeting uh, for Arlington, and uh, on behalf of this town body, we welcome you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I also wanted to welcome some parents uh, who are also here from the community to hear what you have to share about your vision today. Um, Arlingtonians are very passionate about Minuteman. And uh, so um, last night um, at 10 o'clock, uh, I had a couple of, um, I, I've been talking to some Arlington parents, but um, there were some uh, uh, recent developments that have been happening. So at last night at 10 o'clock, I put in a, um, a letter to talk about some of this. and also some budgetary questions that came out of that. So I submitted the letter on behalf of the group, but I will not be talking about the contents of that. I think everyone in this town hall has- We don't need to talk about what we're not gonna talk about. We'll talk about what we should talk about under the budget. Right, okay. so that's okay. what I'm saying. I'm gonna keep it to the budget only okay. section. That's implicit, yeah. Yes. Um, so one of the things as a, town, uh, a new superintendent, um, I was really glad to see that you were doing stakeholder meetings and um, you know, one of them was also in Arlington. So I was wondering, has that also been a driver for this budget that you have 
presented to us, like the feedback that you've gotten from stakeholder communities? The stakeholder uh, feedback, I would say yes, in the sense that I heard from our families the need for continued um, growth and improvement of our programs um, and the um, continued improvement of teaching and learning. So yes. Okay. Okay. Um, was part of the feedback uh, related to any that you needed that there needed to be any changes in the administrative um, staff based on the stakeholder feedback sessions that you had because you're new you're trying to understand the culture mm -hmm. so I was wondering is that something that you also heard that there was concerned concerns about um, the administrative department in Minuteman so as in, in re as it's I'm related just interject for a second is this a budget question yeah. okay uh, all right thank you Maria. Um, I also uh, saw uh, um, thank you very much by the way I did ask you for enrollment numbers and I did ask you pretty late so I I asked you on Saturday and I really appreciate you sharing that information with me um, in the past I think we uh, we had the breakdown of the numbers of who are coming in in the town at, at a town level mm -hmm. and I think uh, as the town meeting body we all really like that I think that you shared that as a um, percentage so one of the things I wanted to know was um, as you were presenting this to the town select board budget uh, to to the finance committee as well as the select board did you anticipate some of the um, changes that would be happening that would impact the budget um, where you would need to maybe do uh, uh, you know do an outreach to recruit new uh, staff I'm not clear on what you're asking. Um, okay, so what I was trying to understand is uh, the elephant in the room is. Yeah, okay. ele elephants are not in school. So anyway, <laughs> all right. So um, do you have any budget for, um, you know, looking for a new key administrator as the principal that is part of this budget already so the FY 24 budget request meets the needs of all of the um, uh, staffing needs that we need so it's all in the budget okay which includes the search process as well the, it, it has the in the budget everything we need for meeting all of our staffing needs correct Um, uh, one of the drivers that you mentioned mm -hmm. was um, the teacher's contract, mm -hmm. right? So um, Arlingtonians, we love our teachers, and mm -hmm. I think one of the things uh, from a recent meeting, as you've heard, there have been some concerns, and so um, with the no vote confidence, um, and so I was wondering, do you anticipate any issues of the ability to do negotiation with the teachers' union with recent developments that impacts the budget? Uh, Mr. Rudman, do you have an answer to that question? And yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman. Uh, Minuteman School Committee. I was a member of the uh, negotiation subcommittee. Uh, two other school committee members were with me. Uh, officers of the Minuteman Faculty Association uh, represented their members. I believe we concluded our uh, contract negotiations a little more than a month ago. Uh, we came to agreement. The lawyers are writing up the memorandum of understanding right now. So as uh, far as uh, the collective bargaining agreement for the next three years that is as they say done and dusted okay um i do have some questions you have about 30 seconds i apologize that the timer is not okay visible i do have some questions about the enrollment numbers um can you speak a little bit to 
um, uh, to the wait list um, that Arlington students have? I think there's six. So is there and are they going to be rejected or are they, um, is there any consideration or is it too early if you could speak to that? It would be too early at this time as we are still accepting off, um, off making offers as students may be declining. But as of um, currently, 46 have accepted from Arlington. Mm -hmm. And so far, we do have six on the wait list. But as seats open up, we most often um, fill up all of the seats so that we aim to have zero on the wait list. But I cannot guarantee that this year as uh, member towns have increased their enrollments each year. Okay. okay. And thank we're you. at we're at time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Thank Zendel. you. And thank, thank you for the tour around the borders of Scope. <laughs> we'll, we'll take Mr. Kepline next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Kepline, Precinct Nine. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, at previous town meetings, this has been an opportunity for a man to really do a pitch and familiarize people with the services and the great work you do mm -hmm. and uh, the academics and uh, practical uh, education you give. Um, so I'd, I'd wish to see some of that. But I did have a sort of a question on education. And I'm wondering if you are working with the Arlington Public Schools to maybe figure out the boundaries between the tech education that you do and maybe what the high school here could do and if there's any sort of shift that might we, we might anticipate. So I'm sorry that's not budget, but it may affect future budgets. Yeah. So well, future budgets are, well, I'll give some latitude here. I, I guess I'll, I'll allow the question and the answer within the scope of does the current budget set up responsibly for future budgets on that point? So in regards to that comment, our current budget does set us up for responsible future budgets. And I would um, say that we're always open to, to partnering and collaborating with our sending member town schools. And so we look forward to um, collaborating with all of Arlington's schools um, and um, sharing what we do with programs and also allowing Arlington students to have access to experience what we have in regards to um, tours. I know that we um, just hosted a uh, number of classes from Arlington for different events. So there's that type of collaboration, but in specifically to what you're asking about the tech and the high school, we, we're always open for um, partnerships. Okay, thank you. Um, and now to, to budgets. Um, sure. So the student enrollment's up 10% and the operating expenses are up 27 or 8 percent is that right and I'm wondering um, what's the source of the operating budget increase did you want it I'm trying to specify like as far as the operating increase our operating budget most of it is taken up by um, teacher salaries, right? And two thirds of our, uh, about um, give or take an estimate, two thirds of our uh, staffing are on the top salary schedule. So mm -hmm. there's some of that that takes up a lot um, of the operating cost. So if, if Nikki would like to come up, our business manager, want to elaborate more on that? I think you just introduce your, your name and role or title. Uh, Nikki Andrade, business manager. Um, as Dr. Dawson was saying, I will just uh, elaborate further. Um, some of our major drivers are the teachers contract that was being negotiated um, in addition to the new teachers that we needed to, based on the growing enrollment, hire. Um, as well as inflation. Yep. Uh, inflation We're all suffering is, from inflation. Is, is hitting everybody's pockets. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly um, for our students to be able to um, continue with the state of art equipment, they certainly have to have the supplies and materials um, and able to do all the different programs. So that's certainly a, a driver as well, um, not only affecting our, all of our personal pockets, but 
um, the vocational space yeah. in particular. Consumable costs of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, one last question is, um, uh, what sort of uh, costs are you looking at for uh, recruitment and you know headhunter fees or a search committee to uh, to find replacement uh, teachers and principal? So as stated earlier, we have our internal team that works on recruitment and retention for any and all vacancies that is covered within the budget. So they, they'll do a national search themselves? Well, we post, for, we post nationally yeah. as well as internally for some um, vacancies. And we do outreach with our college partners, our business partners, for any a number of our vacancies that we have. Okay. And, and you'll expect to fill these positions soon? Or? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kepline. We'll take Mr. Hamlin next. Guillermo Hamlin, Precinct 14, I move to terminate the debate. Okay, we, have, we have a motion to terminate the debate and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating the debate on Article, uh, Article 44 uh, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. Uh, the, the, the no's have it, or at least it's not two thirds anyway. Okay, let's take uh, Ms. Carmi next. Hi, Gina Carmi, Precinct 16. I just want to know, um, are there any pending lawsuits or liabilities that the school is facing? Are there any pending lawsuits or liabilities that the school is facing? And the, can, can you explain the, the relevance to the budget? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm asking you to explain oh, to me um, the relevance of the budget. Well, um, it would affect the budget. Um, like, like the cost associated with it, is, yes. is that, has that been considered in the construction of the budget? Yes. Okay. Dr. Dawson? So the school district is not a party to any active litigation as we speak that I'm aware of and legal counsel has always advised me not to discuss publicly any pending or active litigation cases. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's it. Mrs. Orfanos. Let's, uh, let's keep the chatter down a bit. Um, name and precinct, please. Michelle Orfanos, Precinct 13. Good evening. Michelle Orfanos, Precinct 13. Good evening. As I was looking into the financial impact recruitment and retention has on school budgets, I came across this quote. There are no great schools without great teachers. With that being said, I was very concerned when on May 1st, after previous grievance filing, the entire faculty at Minuteman High School held a unanimous vote of no confidence in the superintendent. Myself and many other and the, parents, sorry, the, the, this is our it's policy. not a large leap to get the, to the, the, the budget if, with if this. You can, if you can tie this, if, if you can make the case to I, me that this is related to the budget. I will. I'm getting there. Okay. Well, well, well Many other about, parents want I, I don't want to hear about getting there. I want to no, please cut to the chase. What impact this would have on the this school. I, I'm getting there. You've got to give me a minute. Okay, but you have to tie it directly. I am going to. Okay. Gosh, if any time they needed, you said you didn't want to have passionate debate. If any time in culture we needed open, passionate debate, it's today. Continue. Myself and many other parents wondered what impact financially this would have on the school and more importantly the students. In speaking with Michael Ruderman of the school committee, we discussed financial impacts of the superintendent's decision 
not to renew the principal's contract, seeing that it's already led to four resignations. Mr. Rudiman acknowledged that this was a historic vote and has never happened in Miniman's history. What would be the financial consequences? What will be the financial consequences? How will the school manage the inevitable upcoming faculty resignations? Mr. Rudiman said four words, they will be replaced. Focusing solely on the financial aspects, replacing a teacher requires significant resources and personnel time. Although costs within a district or school can vary substantially, the most significant costs are those associated with separation, recruiting, and new hiring teachers and training replacements. The superintendent has noted that there are already eight full-time positions that need to be filled, nine, if you go ahead with the principal. According to the Society of Human Resource Management, SHRM, employees estimate the total cost of new hiring employees can be three to four times the position salary. Employee News said that to replace the cost of an employee, a teacher, is 33% of the annual salary. That ties in with the budget. It's not a big leap. Work Institute 2017 retention report stated the replacement cost for teachers is possibly annually 15000 per person on a median salary of 45000 a year. Indeed, the cost of vacancies is critical. I wonder if you've truly thought about and are aware of the negative impact these vacancies are gonna generate. Research also shows teacher turnout consistently undermines student achievement in core academic subjects. Turnover also negatively impacts a school's culture. It's my understanding that morale is at an all-time low. As parents can rescind their acceptance, 46 people, you said, accepted, accepted, was it 46? Students that you accepted, 46? From Arlington, yes. Parents can rescind the acceptance at any time. How does the today's student-led walkout and all the negative social media and news surrounding Minuteman affect new student enrollment Ms. and Ms. employees? Mrs. Orfanos, this is... Wow. This, this is beyond... If 100% of the excuse, faculty excuse me, vote... There will be order in this chamber, possible? Mrs. Orfanos. I'm going to answer your question. How is it possible that 100% of the faculty voting no confidence doesn't impact staff retention or recruitment? Just, the, can you answer that? Mrs. Orfanos. That's not a She doesn't have question. to answer the question because okay. I'm ruling it out of scope. Okay. With all the recent events... There are far too many questions that need to be addressed before Arlington considers voting on this budget. We cannot in good conscience vote to allocate good money after bad policy. Do you have anything to say to anything I've said? I appreciate your research. Well, well, Mrs. Orfanos, your questions will be directed at the chair. To you? Yes. <laughs> I thought we were here, okay. I, I allow the conversations to, to get a little conversational so during I, debate so I at ask times. You, please, please so don't interrupt then me. Then I ask you. Not when you interrupt me, no. I allow the, the, the back and forth to be a bit conversational when it's more efficient for the meeting as an optimization for all of our time. Okay. But not when it's going to be this level of um, tension between the interactions. I am here to mediate and moderate the discussion. Okay, so as stated, the principal stated, the superintendent stated they value students, all the students, and their learning. I believe the students have been through a lot through three years, and they've lost enough educational time. I really hope you can reconsider. Minuteman is worth saving. Thank you. M Mr. Tusty. Al Tosti, Precinct 17. It was a hard act to follow. Uh, I put together last week a nice chart, and went on to the Department of Education database, and uh, put it all together, all the vocational schools 
and their per student costs. Unfortunately, due to my technical incompetence, I wasn't able to get it in the queue, so you people probably couldn't see it up there anyway, but um, I'm going to say something that most of you already know, um, and I think the superintendent knows also. Uh, Minuteman, besides great reputation, is the most expensive vocational school in the, uh, in the state. Uh, the spending, this is for fiscal 22, was over $34,000 per student. The only one other vocational school in the state that was in the 30s was Greater Lawrence at 31. Almost all the others were down in the $24,000 to $26,000 a year category. Um, not only does Arlington want a great school, uh, but we need an affordable school too. Are there things, and I'm not blaming you for this, uh, this has been the case for years and years, but are there things that Minuteman can do to help bring down this costs uh, so for the taxpayers of the town of Arlington and our budgets? And thank you. Dr. Dawson. Thank you, moderator. It is true that we are one of the highest per pupil, and as previous, previously shared, please understand that we are also one of the highest um, districts, that highest paying districts of um, teacher salaries. And with the two-third of almost on average two-third of our staff being on the top step of the salary schedule, um, it does eat up most of our um, operating um, operating budget. And just kind of breaking that down a little bit, the salaries are 47.4% of the operating and capital budget. Employee benefits are 12.3%, totaling 59.7%. And then, of course, capital is 22.7%. Our total operating budget, the salaries are 61.2%, and employee benefits 15.8, which totals 77% of our operating budget. That coupled with the needs of our students and the funding that is required to meet the needs of our students, unfortunately, that is part of why our um, per people expenditure is as high as it is. I think that considering also that we have such a high percentage of our um, veteran teachers, I, you know, the only way that I can see at this point of lowering assessments is as we bring in new teachers, if their salaries are lower, that could be a possibility, but we, are, we truly value our teachers and they're worth every penny that they're paid. So um, unfortunately at this time, we do not have a plan as far as what you're looking for. I wish I had the right answer for you, um, but considering 77% is toward salaries, it's, um, it's hard to say. But that's why we do go for um, grants as much as we can, so we're not asking for more than we have to. Great, thank you. And let's take Ms. Hyman next. Deepa, hi, I'm Precinct 15. Um, as many in this body know, um, I'm fairly critical of Minuteman because of the per student cost. Sorry. As many of you know, I'm very critical of Minuteman because of the per student cost. Um, I do have a question about that per student cost. Are all programs at Minuteman the same cost per student? So, for instance, would a student in robotics, because of the lab expenditures, other than the teaching, which we know you can't control those salaries, um, need the same, the rest of the budget, the same as somebody, let's say, who is in an auto shop? I'm going to ask Ms. Um, Andre to correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say it is not equal because each program has different needs and the, the cost to run each program varies. So it is not equal. It's equitable. It's based on what is needed. And the teachers um, put in their department budget requests each year for the following you know, fiscal year based on the needs to run the program. And because of that um, and because of the impact on your budget, do you have an assessment of the students who apply, what their area of program 
is, their interest in the area program is, and how that then um, translates into the acceptance rates and the wait list and who, whether the more expensive programs are getting filled, whether the less expensive, whether programs where there might be some comparable program at Arlington High School versus students that are interested in HVAC where there is no comparable program at Arlington High School. Do you have any sort of assessment like that? So I know that for students coming into Minuteman, I can't speak of Arlington um, High School, but for students coming into Minuteman, we do not accept them based upon what they're interested in because part of our philosophy is that our students come in as freshmen and we allow them to explore the options for them to choose at that time. Now, a number of them do have interest, the programs, but as they explore, it, um, it may change. And the uh, only time that we consider what they would prefer is if there is a slot available and if a student wants to change after they've selected already. But that doesn't impact our budget. Um, I, because you've told me that there is a difference in the cost of the programs, and I also know that previous Minuteman selection criteria for students were biased towards students that were um, higher achieving in a traditional education setting, which is not always aligned with those that are seeking a vocational setting. Um, you know, I would... I would wonder if you, there could be some focus on that analysis so that we make sure that this town's commitment to financially supporting our vocational pathway truly is a vocational pathway for students that might not see a pathway through our main public high school. And um, so, I, it's, I just, um, to abbreviate it, in the past, it seems like students that might have been going towards computer programming or software design had an edge up under the Minuteman selection criteria. And as we know from the state law, the mandate of vocational schools is to provide the opportunity for high school to internship to career rather than the, tr the traditional college pathway. And I would just ask, as you look at the budget and you look at the expenditures on the programs, that we make sure that we are fulfilling our commitment to those students. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Ms. Hyam. Mr. Slickman. Good evening, Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I served as a member of the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School Committee from 1997 to 2001. Uh, how many towns are required to approve your budget? Two-thirds, moderator, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Two-thirds. Yeah, two Two-thirds of nine towns? Six, I, we six, had 16 towns when I was a member. Correct, six uh, out of nine. Six sorry. out of nine. Have you achieved that at this point? Yes, we have. Okay, so this, this budget is approved regardless of what we do. <laughs> I suggest we approve it. Now, one thing we have to note is that back in the day when I was a member of the Minuteman School Committee, a third of the students were in district. A third of them came under a program called Chapter 74, which was a full tuition, and a third of them came on school choice at $5,000 a, a pupil. So with a third of the member town enrollment and a third of the member town assessment, we were subsidizing about $8,000 per student by a third of all the out-of-district students coming in. Now. We built a new high school. It is now suddenly very attractive. MSBA came along and said you have to have a smaller school because you have a smaller demographic. A couple of the problematic towns got out of the district, and we used the opportunity of the new school to Well, let's not cast aspersions on other towns. Well, <laughs> and we <laughs> And we use the opportunity to change the regional agreement so we have a weighted vote. So our influence is higher. But before us today is one thing and one thing only. Do we approve the budget amount 
recommended by the Finance Committee. Those are the four corners of the scope. Do we approve it? Yes or no? Losing the member town and uh, the non-member district students was funded in such a way that you had sort of a reserve fund that came and followed back and, and, and sort of operates in many ways like some of our uh, revolving funds. And losing that income is going to have a temporary blip and it's going to be a bouncy couple of years because for the first time, Minuteman has a wait list. We never had it before. We were under-enrolled. We were drastically under-enrolled at one point. This is a good school. And within the scope of what we do, we should approve this budget. Now, I also remind you what our role is, what the school committee's role is, and the superintendent's role under the Education Reform Act of 1993. Superintendent has total discretion on personnel decisions, period. It's not our role to do that. It's our role to vote the budget. Please vote the budget. Thank you, Mr. Slickman. We'll take Mr. Greenspawn next. And as Mr. Greenspawn comes up, I just want to clarify a point that Mr. Slickman made. Uh, the four corners of scope implies that it is a rectangle embedded in two-dimensional space, Euclidean space. <laughs> and we should not make those assumptions. Mr. Greenspawn? Uh, given my role as a physicist, I should debate this, but I won't. Um, <laughs> uh, Andy Greenspawn, uh, Precinct 5. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move to terminate debate on this article. Ooh, that was so close, but you made a comment. <laughs> before you move the question. So I do not recognize the motion, I'm sorry. Point of order, Mr. it was a joke? The, the same thing happened to me once. I made a brief joke. It was maybe a little bit funnier than that, and I still, <laughs> and I still couldn't terminate debate. So we'll take Mr. Grunucci next. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see Mr. Logan. I'm sorry, sorry about that. The queue jumped on me. Apologies. William Logan, Precinct 2. I'd like to introduce a Arlington resident who would like to speak. Um, okay. Their name is Claudia Donette. And Claudia Donette, and uh, uh, is she a, she, you said she's a resident of Arlington? Yes. Okay, she has the right to speak. Okay, is there a microphone in the a floating mic in the balcony that she can use. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, um, William Logan, for introducing me. Okay, thank you, you, you. you probably have to hold it closer to your uh, to your voice. Can you hear me now? Just, just. Can we adjust the, the gain on the mic, maybe? Is this better? Yes. Hello? My name is Claudia yeah, Donet. Can, maybe just try speaking up and have it like really close to your mouth, maybe, to your voice. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can even hardly hear him. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Oh, is, 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 do you have the green or red microphone? I think we can adjust it down here. Oh, she's coming down. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, can I just take a second? Mr. Moderator, we've had trouble hearing you up here all evening and on oh, really? the other okay. speakers as well. Okay. Is that something we can adjust? Different from other days. Okay. Thank you. I don't know where she went, though. She's coming down. Is it better if I speak like this? Okay. Hi, welcome. Just uh, name and precinct, please. Claudia Donet, precinct number nine. Um, I'm here um, as um, I'm a parent currently of a student in um, We were really um, surprised to hear the recent developments. So, how that uh, this um, have to do with budget 
And one of the things that we were discussing here is projecting numbers of students entering Minutemen. All I can say is from my personal experience, and from, I know many others I speak to, um, this has been the um, amazing word that we receive about the culture at Minutemen and how students who had trouble in other environments were thriving here. So that's how uh, the process really works when students come because other parents were talking about how things were working so well, how the culture was so amazing to promote the best in our kids. Um, so when we're discussing, I, I think we are not ready to know exactly the numbers we can project. At this point, the students could decide to pull off from, from incoming. Um, when I entered, parents advised me to go to the school. They were right. Um, when I talked to other parents of students looking for schools, I advised them to go there. But I was going based on my experience of these two years and the previous experience that I heard of. So we are not sure how that's going to look like when all the students, a uh, ton of parents, and unanimous vote of the teacher union is not happy with what is happening now. We think that Mr. Clement was really... Um, yes, uh, we really yep. need to keep this within so, the scope of the budget. So yes, so basically I feel that we are not ready to really understand the, the budget uh, when we are not sure what's going to happen, how many teachers will need to be replaced, how the culture will change. Um, I think I will leave it at that. But I, I make a strong point here because basically it's, it's, I'm talking about feelings, but it's the feelings that create those data, that, the data, the numbers, how many students and who are coming into this school. Um, thank you. Very thank much. you. We'll take Mr. Grinichi next. Carmine Granucci, Precinct 21. I move to terminate debate and all matters before. Okay, we have a motion to terminate the debate. We have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 44, say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is terminated. Uh, let's now move to, uh, before we open up voting, let me just summarize uh, that you can vote yes to appropriate $8,932,916 for the town's share of the operating and maintenance costs of the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School District budget to be expended under the direction of the Minuteman Regional Vocational High School Committee. Okay, that's what we're voting on. If you do not approve of that appropriation, you can vote no. Uh, so let's open voting now for the main motion under Article 44. Voting is now open. Okay, let's close voting. And the budget passes, 203 in the affirmative, 20 in the negative, and seven abstentions. So it is now, uh, Mr. Rubin. Just wanted to say thank you to the members of the meeting. Thank you to the Finance Committee, in particular our liaison, uh, Annie LaCourt, uh, who's, who's looked at a lot of Minuteman budgets. Uh, thank you all very much. You don't get to keep that money, Mr. Rudiman. Okay, so it's 9.30, let's take a 10 minute break, a strict 10 minute break, uh, and we'll start at 9.40, thank you. Okay, we're gonna get started now. We're making some adjustments to the audio in the balcony, which will hopefully help. Um, And as we're getting settled here, I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, 
that I, I rescind my criticism of Mr. Slickman's comment. I spoke with Finance Committee, and budgets usually do come in the form, literally, of rectangles in the form of tables. So it literally does have four corners. Um, okay. So now Ms. Deschler. Uh, so now we're calling this meeting back to order. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Mr. Moderator, I move that Article 12 be taken from the table. Okay, we have a motion to take Article 12 from the table, and we have a second. This is an article that was previously postponed. Um, all those in favor, say yes. yes. All those opposed? Article 12 is now removed from the table. Okay. All right, let's, let's settle down. Let's settle down. Let's see, Mr. Helmet, did you have any introduction you wanted to give? Okay, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Eric Helmet. How's my volume? Yeah, uh, yeah, good. Please. Oh, and FYI, we'll start the speaker queue after Mr. Helmet's comments, just so we don't interrupt that uh, we, got, again. we got somebody up there, they're gonna work on it live, so thank you for that feedback. Uh, Eric Helmet, Chair of the Select Board. The Select Board unanimously and strongly urges no action on Article 12. Um, I'm just going to briefly state our principal reasons. There's going to be a lot of discussion and debate, as there should be. Uh, we really felt, feel that the town already has balanced regulatory and policy bodies that deal with this, that address the health, the environmental concerns, and the recreational needs of our playing fields in our visual turf. That's the Conservation Commission, the Board of Health, the Parks and Recreation, Park and Recreation Commission, and the town manager and the vast professional staff that we have. And we are confident that that process works and that it is fair and that it represents the different perspectives and different priorities that we have in this debate. The board also believes that this, this is a the hazards of artificial turf really important. The science in this is developing. Uh, in our judgment, uh, although we are not scientists, but listening to the debate, there's not the kind of broad consensus yet, at least, on the risk, particularly regarding the acceptable levels of exposure. And we believe that, therefore, the best policy is instead of a moratorium, which we feel is not the right tool for this nuanced question, would be a site-by-site -site analysis done by the bodies that we already have that look hard at the science, look hard at the hazards and look hard at the needs and make a determination about whether a site is appropriate, whether mitigation can be put into place, what the acceptable standards would be as the uh, science continues to evolve. And a moratorium doesn't really facilitate that. So we feel like it's not the right tool. We trust the current process. We trust our town manager and our next one to be fair, to put together uh, bodies that would study this fairly and consider all the angles. So for that reason, we urge no action on Article 12. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Okay, let's now clear and open the speaker queue and show that. We're good. And there it is. Okay. We have several motions that were submitted in advance, and we have a specific order uh, in which we will go through them, which was previously shared. So I'll now invite up uh, Ms. Milofchik to introduce her substitute motion to lead us off. We have more motions on this article than some town meetings have articles in their warrants, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. May I have my slides, please? for my presentation. Yeah, this is the substitute motion. There was a slide deck. Thank you. Beth Malofchek, town meeting member, precinct nine. Next slide, please. The Malofchek substitute motion would establish a study committee 
pause any new artificial turf until a report is submitted no later than spring 2025, but maybe sooner. Next slide, please. Crumb rubber is dangerous. It contains polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, plasticizers, carbon black, styrene, neurotoxins, carcinogens, and many of the newer natural infill materials, including Brockfill, contain toxins. Next slide, please. There is PFAS in plastic glass. In 2019, public employees for environmental responsibility discovered that artificial turf contains poly, uh, polyfluoral alkyl substances, PFAS, the forever chemicals, the one you don't want any exposure to. PFAS are persistent. They, are, they bioaccumulate. They are toxic. All artificial turf that have been studied have PFAS, all of them. Next slide, please. Plastic turf causes local plastic pollution. You can see it over on the Catholic field on Summer Street. A 20-ton plastic field, two acres, sheds 480 pounds of microplastics each year into our mill brook, into the food chain. These plastic particles don't degrade. They accumulate in the environment, soil, water, and in your next fish fillet or lobster roll. Next slide, please. PFAS are toxic forever chemicals. They interfere with the body's natural hormones. They are hormone disruptors. They increase cancer risk. They reduce fetal growth. They do other deleterious, they have other deleterious influences on the developing child's body. Next slide, please. There is no safe level of PFAS. The EPA, as recently as March 2023, proposed maximum Four parts per trillion for PFAS. Four parts per trillion. That's equivalent to a drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. There is no dose below which PFAS is considered safe. Next slide, please. PFAS leaches off artificial turf fields into water from the wetland streams, rivers, and oceans into the food chain. The surrounding area quickly becomes contaminated of these sports fields. In Martha's Vineyard, a study showed that 12 points per trillion of PFAS leaches off of a new field. Next slide, please. Artificial turf contributes to climate change. Natural grass absorbs CO2 and releases oxygen. Artificial turf does the opposite. It releases CO2, methane, and other chemicals. The manufacturing, installation, service, and disposal of a two-acre artificial turf field generates a total, over its lifetime, 55.6 metric tons of CO2. We won't get to met zero with that. Next slide, please. Artificial turf sheds microplastics, 480 pounds a year. Next slide, please. Artificial turf is not recycled in the U.S., not recycled. The Pennsylvania Rematch Recycling Facility has not been built yet. It is being fined by the state of Pennsylvania because they are stockpiling old fields. Exxon's Texas Advanced Recycling Plant that we've heard about uses pyrolysis, considered incineration by the EPA. It releases PFAS and dioxin up the smokestack and into our air. There is no recycling of artificial turf. There's repurposing. There is no recycling. Next slide, please. Artificial turf is a disposal nightmare. This is the site in Pennsylvania, the stockpiling, rolls of discarded plastic turf. It's not recyclable. It lasts forever. The peach, the, this is the third site that these, maybe, maybe more, where these PFASs are leaching out. They leach out where it's produced, where it's installed, and then where it gets um, uh, disposed and leaching toxins into the environment. Next slide, please. PFAS is the new asbestos. EPA's new maximum contaminant level will open the door to huge liabilities. States are making even more stringent maximal contaminant levels. Class action suits for contaminated water abound. Next slide, please. States are trying to ban artificial turf. Bills are pending in California, Massachusetts, Vermont, and Connecticut. Next slide, please. Vote yes on the Malofchek substitute motion. Vote no on the others. Vote yes on ours. To establish a study committee, pause any new artificial turf until a report is submitted no later than spring 2025, but maybe sooner. Next slide, please. Article 12 is a response to the land management plan. Article 12 substitute motion is a response to the idea that plastic fields are safe. 
They are not safe. We have worked with the scientific community, with toxicologists, ecologists. We worked with the scientists who discovered PFAS in artificial turf in 2019, Kyla Bennett and Jeff Gerhardt. We brought them to you. We produced two videos with them. We brought the science to you. Me, Robin, Winnell, and Jordan. We did this work for you, this research for our community. There is no artificial turf without PFAS. There are tests which will not find PFAS. These are promoted to offer a false sense of security. Don't believe them. Arlington faces a public health and environmental health challenge. The stakeholders are not just players. All of the town residents are stakeholders. Please vote for the Malofchik substitute motion. Vote no on the others. If you want to make it a one-year research juggernaut, we can give you some tips. Vote yes on the Schlickman Amendment. Otherwise, please vote no and all the others vote yes on the Malofchik. I thank you, Mr. Moderator, and I thank town meeting. Thank you, Ms. Malofchik. Um, and just a note here, like technically, you, you can go back there. Um, oh, oh, normally, we would only allow uh, debate within the scope of the pending motions, but because of the, this, there, there are some subtle interdependencies between some of these motions, so I'll allow uh, a limited form of commentary as they're being introduced uh, across the motions, even for motions that have not been introduced yet, to, to a point. Uh, now, oh, I don't believe we did, thank you. Uh, so we actually, uh, Ms. Malofchak, we actually need a motion. Keep it. You can just move to substitute the main motion with Mr. Moderator, town meeting, I move to uh, substitute the motion with the substitute motion. Yep, and we have a, we have a, we have a motion to substitute, and we have a second, uh, and we have a second, and it is now before us. So we now have the main motion of no action, and we have the Malofchik substitute motion stacked on top of it. I'll now in, um, invite Dr. Vakil to introduce the Vakil Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sanjay Vakil, Precinct 12. Uh, I've learned several specific things in the process of reviewing the research. Number one, PFAS is a real problem. Based on my research, and thankfully from the folks that put this together, provided by the proponents, I've retired my nonstick pan, which is the biggest single source. Number two, there's a massive difference in PFAS and other chemicals admitted by artificial turf fields depending on the specific manufacturer and technology used. We should choose carefully. Number three, the current research brings me to the conclusion that the incremental exposure to these chemicals from artificial turf is real, but relatively small. And in my judgment, the benefits of the additional field time to the mental and physical health of our kids outweighs the incremental risk. I say this personally as a father of three who knows exactly how much my kids lost when they didn't have outdoor time during COVID. The research here is relatively new and I expect it to evolve. My opinion and judgment will evolve as well. The goal of my amendment is to provide some very clear guidance to the town and Parks and Rec to choose a field technology which minimizes the risk to those using the field while leaving a path forward to installing artificial turf where it is deemed necessary. I'm hands happy to answer specific questions about my analysis and decisions if meeting members wish, but I don't want to waste any of your time. I will be voting no on the substitute motion. If you choose to vote yes, I recommend that you vote in my amendment as well. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Pickel, can you make your motion? I would like to make a motion to amend. Okay. We have a motion to amend with the Vakil Amendment. We have a second. That is now before us as well. Thank you. Uh, I now invite Mr. Greenspawn to introduce his amendment. And as he comes up, I just want to make a brief comment on the ordering of these. I applied the Ross rule uh, in determining the order, the sequence of the motions, which is to start with the broad strokes first and then go to the finer strokes, as in Bob Ross, the legendary painter. Mr. Greenspawn. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andy Greenspawn, Precinct 5. Um, all right. Uh, my plain comments got somewhat thrown out the window this afternoon, given the Belmont Hill School said they're stepping back from any potential deal to revitalize the Poets Corner playing fields for the full foreseeable future. I would still urge voting for this amendment to exempt the turf moratorium for any town-owned or future town-acquired land at Poets Corner for a few reasons. Poets Corner is in a state of disrepair due to deferred maintenance and also, also resides on top of an old municipal landfill that was not capped according to now modern requirements. 
The town at present does not have the funds to repair this town-owned land, about three acres, which Park and Recreation has stated would cost about $3 million currently. In addition, it is unclear how or to whom the Archdiocese of Boston may now sell the adjacent six acres of land they own. Depending on underlying contamination and wetlands, the price could be fairly low due to a uh, few potential development opportunities, except maybe open space. It is even possible the town maybe, hopefully, could buy, and buy the land and wait to develop it or wait for a private partner to help develop it. Another private party could come along to help develop it for open space. If some alternative pub, uh, private public partnership comes along in the next two years or sooner, we wouldn't want to stop any potential development that may involve all natural grass or a mix of natural grass and artificial turf. Given that artificial turf companies are listening to the concerns of the public and are adjusting their materials and manufacturing methods, we should not blanket, blanket ban such a possibility. Additionally, it appears clear that the Conservation Commission would have a say in any potential developments around Poets Corner anyway, given the likelihood that there is at least some amount of wetlands covering that area. While I personally am unsure about the moratorium on artificial turf for the rest of Arlington, and maybe we'll have that decision in the next hour, uh, I have filled this, filed this amendment to seek a compromise position at the time that might be able to achieve a larger consensus of town meeting. Uh, sorry, I lost my chair. Um, I know we have additional amendments that may further change my amendment, but I think it's helpful for our constituents, of which we've probably heard from a lot of residents in town, and uh, helpful for the town manager and uh, town staff to see where a town meeting stands on the artificial turf issue. Um, in all it's the, the, these grainy details of amendments in case further opportunities to redevelop or reconstruct more open space and playing fields come to our door. Um, Parks and Rec and the town manager should have an idea of what types of fields we would be willing to support in the future so that we don't uh, end up in this situation possibly in the future. So um, I move my, the Greenspun amendment for the amendment to the substitute motion and thank you everyone. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second? We have a second to the motion to amend the Milovchik substitute motion with the Greenspawn Amendment. I now invite Mr. Slickman to introduce his amendment. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. In this hall last Tuesday, two administrative bodies in the executive branch of our town government were sharply divided over the prospects of a moratorium on turf fields. The narratives were sharply different. One narrative focuses on protecting us from hazardous chemicals. The other focuses on the need for more playing fields in town. Town meeting, as the legislative branch of government, has the authority and responsibility to make policy decisions about playing fields and artificial turf beyond the scope of what we can enact tonight. Recent discussion wanders in and out of the four corners of this trapezoidal article before us. I'll allow it. <laughs> My sense is that lush, well-maintained natural grass is a good thing, and absent any other considerations of the preferred playing surface. The playing fields in Arlington lack well-maintained natural grass. The line of accountability for the fields leads back here to town meeting as town meeting is the appropriating authority that approves the budgets that support field maintenance. Arlington doesn't have enough fields to meet the needs of our community. The problem is exasperated when rainy weather prompts the town to take fields offline. There are places where natural, uh, natural turf is important or artificial turf is important, but not if not essential. Uh, we only need to look at the athletic fields behind Arlington High School, where the artificial turf is a barrier and part of the cap over a site that was contaminated with hexavalent chromium and manufactured gas products. According to the Boston Globe, the toxic materials polluted Cutter's Pond, which was filled in in 1932 to create the high school's football field, and migrated underground to other parts of the immediate area. Ms. Malofchek's substitute motion recognizes this reality as it exempted the Arlington High School project from her proposed moratorium. Some artificial turf is better than others. After considering the evidence derived from a study, town meeting may choose to set standards for artificial turf. For example, town meeting may choose to ban crumb rubber, but permit organic turf infill. In any case, there are decisions we are not prepared to make tonight and decisions we are prohibited from making tonight. 
because they are beyond the scope of any article uh, before the 2023 town meeting, which is why I'm offering an amendment to Ms. Malofchek's substitute motion that will limit the moratorium to one year and require the committee formed under this article to present their findings at the 2024 annual town meeting. Under my amendment, the study committee and the moratorium will expire with the dissolution of the 2024 annual town meeting, which will give everyone the chance to submit warrant articles and other sufficient data that will enable us to make informed decisions. This will also allow town meeting to vote a budget that is aligned with the funding required to maintain viable turf fields. My sense is the town meeting needs more time and more information before it votes to regulate artificial turf. I don't believe a majority of town meeting wants to ban artificial turf, and I don't believe a majority wants to walk away and allow artificial turf to be unregulated. I move to amend Ms. Malofchek's substitute motion to give us a gift of time, a short time frame, where we can consider the standards we want to set for our playing surfaces without obstructing any potential proposals for playing fields in Arlington. Please vote yes on my amendment. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion to amend the Milovchik, the Milovchik substitute motion with the Schlichtman Amendment. Do we have a second? We have a second. It is now pending before us. I now invite Ms. Palisade to introduce her amendment. And if, by the way, if you're just clicking into the speaker queue now, you probably won't speak before the Schlichtman Amendment expires. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Janice Palisotti, Precinct 8. I rise to submit an amendment to the substitute motion to Article 12. This amendment makes all members of the Artificial Turf Study Committee voting members. The ex officio members have extensive expertise in public health, education, and recreation. Their perspectives need to be fully reflected in the findings and recommendations of the committee. The report to be submitted to this body and available to all Arlington residents needs to include their votes. I ask that you vote in favor of this amendment so that if the substitute motion passes, all members of the committee can participate on equal footing. I ask to submit this motion. Okay, we have a motion uh, to uh, amend the Milovchik substitute motion with the Palisade Amendment, and we have a second. Okay, so that is now pending before us. I now invite uh, Dr. Dennis to introduce uh, his two amendments. He actually submitted more, but you're getting a bargain here. You're welcome. Uh, Greg Dennis, Precinct 1. I move that my two amendments on Article 12 be received. Okay, we have a motion to receive uh, uh, the, the Dennis amendments in front of us. Do we have a second? And we have, we have, I'll count those as two seconds for the two amendments. Go ahead. And could I have my slides queued up, please? There it yes, is. Yes, there we go. Uh, the Article 12 substitute motion has at least three serious flaws and needs amendments. Next slide, please. The first flaw is the denial of voting privileges to some members. While town meeting has allowed for non-voting committee members in some special cases in the past, there is no compelling reason for it here. I served on a committee that for, for a time had non-voting members. I saw how that second class status created a sense of inequity and how it caused some of the non-voting members to simply not show up to meetings. As this motion is written, anyone who has voiced an opinion contrary to that of the proponents has either been relegated to non-voting status or excluded entirely. If we are to have a committee, we need one that is inclusive of the diversity of viewpoints in town on this issue. A fix for this flaw is the Palisade and Dennis One amendments. Palisade gives voting privileges to all members. However, that change by itself would make for an even number of voting members, and ideally committees have an odd number to avoid deadlocking on tie votes and to make it a bit easier to reach quorum. To address this, my amendment reduces the moderator appointees from two to one. It also specifies that this appointee is to be the chair, and I charge the moderator with choosing someone neutral on the question of synthetic turf for the role. I thought it best to, to avoid starting off the first meeting with a contentious election for chair. Next slide, please. 
A second flaw is that the motion charges the committee with reporting only on the potential problems with turf. There's no mention of all the measures that exist to mitigate or eliminate potential issues. Most of our neighboring communities and cohort towns have installed new turf fields recently or have new turf projects underway. In Cambridge, in Somerville, in Belmont, in Watertown, in Winchester, in Brookline, in Boston, and some are doing innovative things in their turf design and procurement, from requiring stronger certifications on turf, to using newer natural infills, to contractually requiring the turf be downcycled at end of life. Please support Dennis Amendment 2 to ensure the committee takes a look at how our neighbors are installing turf and assembles a set of best practices. If we go forward with the turf project in the future, that research would help us do it in the best way possible. Next slide, please. A third flaw is that the substitute motion calls for a moratorium. I had planned on speaking about the outcome of a moratorium, but with today's news, that possible outcome has become a reality. Poets will remain an uncapped landfill in an embarrassing eyesore. The St. Camillus land will be sold to the highest bidder. Projects like POETS are subject to a deliberative process and we gain nothing from preempting that process. It still had to go before the Conservation Commission and after further discussion, the project would have been brought back to town meeting for approval of a land swap. It didn't make sense to decide the fate of the project now when we could have had a proper vote on it in the future with more information in hand. As for the fix, I had originally had an amendment to strike the moratorium section entirely, but I decided to withdraw it to support the Greenspun Amendment save us a bit of time. Despite today's news, I think we should still support the amendment, at least as a symbolic statement. Next slide, please. In making their case for a moratorium, the proponents have cited several communities that purportedly banned or rejected synthetic turf. A little digging reveals many of these examples to be false. Springfield has been touted frequently by proponents as a densely populated community that meets its recreational needs without the need for turf fields. In reality, not only has Springfield relied on turf fields for decades, they have two ongoing projects to install at least three new turf fields. We were told Belmont banned turf. Not true. In 2019, the Belmont High School Building Committee looked at the research and concluded that turf was a safe and superior choice for their new high school. That field was installed in 2021. It's just an eight-minute drive from here if you want to check it out. It's next to an existing turf field they have. We heard that Brookline rejected turf. Nope. At their town meeting last year, Brookline created a committee called the Athletic Surface Task Force, cooler than our name. Um, <laughs> the, the task force found that turf was a safe and acceptable athletic surface, and Brookline is proceeding with a turf installation at their new Driscoll School. We were told Boston banned turf. Not true. That Andover rejected turf. Not true. And of course, there's all our neighboring communities that the pro proponents have not mentioned, like Cambridge and Somerville and Watertown and Winchester, all of whom have installed new turf fields recently. Places like Cambridge and Somerville and Brookline, we know these communities are no slouches at environmental responsibility. Our town meeting has followed their lead on in many environmental articles. They do not have moratoriums. They all continue to approve of or disapprove of new turf fields on a case-by-case -case basis, and so should we. Next slide, please. How did we get to this complicated situation with multiple substitute motions and several subsidiary amendments? Well, an early bad sign was when the proponents showed up to their select board hearing with no details of the study committee. They argued for a moratorium and a vague need to quote unquote study, but not a word was written or uttered about who would be doing the studying, how the committee would be composed, or even if there would be a committee at all. It wasn't until much later that those details were revealed. Earlier public scrutiny and feedback might have given us something better to work with here. Instead, I think we have a motion that is unbalanced, it's not fully baked, and at this point, I doubt parliamentary procedure leads us to any kind of satisfactory action on this article. So yes, we should try to patch this thing up with amendments, but when that's done, we should just vote the whole thing down. If supporters of a study committee want to come back in the fall with a balanced and well-structured proposal, they are welcome to. Thank you. Great, thank you. I now invite uh, Mr. Benson and or Ms. Stamps to introduce the Benson Stamps substitute motion. And while one or both of them come up, um, I just want to clarify that this substitute motion is separate from the Milofchik substitute motion. Only one of them, well, both of them could substitute the main motion, but in the sequence that we're going to do them, one would completely clobber the other. So the, these are not composable. And so, Mr. Benson? I'm waiting for Mr. Benson. Okay.
And to be clear, and while we're waiting here, the, the, the Benson stamp substitute motion stands alone. We do not have any amendments on it, as opposed to the Malofchik substitute motion, which has several amendments stacked on it. Okay, go ahead. Can we have our slide? Can we bring up the slides? My name is Susan Stamps, uh, town meeting member of Precinct 3. Can you hear me okay? And I'm Eugene Benson, uh, Precinct 10 town meeting member. Uh, the first thing we wanted to say was a uh, response to what happened today where we found out that Belmont Hill had pulled, I was not quite sure what they pulled because there was never actually anything that was real. Um, there were no written agreements. There was no money that changed hands to secure future projects or agreements. Um, many people have argued against, some people have argued against Article 12 because they want the Poets' Corner field. Article 12 has never been about Poets' Corner. It's about artificial turf. And Arlington is a very progressive town. We've been a leader in the metropolitan Boston area on environmental issues and this just starting to put poisons in the ground is really not the direction we want to go in so I just wanted to to say the poet's corner really doesn't make any difference to the importance of this article thank you can we um, so we'll make a motion to substitute our motion to the main motion okay Do we have a second okay thank you can you go to the next slide Please. So um, we're going to discuss um, three things. Yeah, sure. Do you want to do this? One? Yeah, you may. Uh, I I was so surprised at having to come up right now that I forgot to bring my the the um, can that we had in the back with the the green circle on it. So if you have that, that summarizes um, what we're asking for tonight. It's very much along the lines of the Malofchik motion. We feel, we feel that it is better in some ways. It is um, to establish an artificial turf sub study committee. We'll get into those details in a minute. And it requires a report from the committee. This is too high. Okay, there we go. I don't really need to stand on tiptoes. It requires a committee, a report from the committee before the spring 2024 town meeting. It could even be a, a one that is submitted to the fall town meeting, and uh, so the time, the more the it's flexible, and there's a moratorium that's one year, and again that's flexible because town meeting at any time can reverse the moratorium. Uh, it exempts the high school from the moratorium because of contracts that um, we already have signed. And as I said, town meeting can lift it at any time. So one of, one of the main reasons why we decided to file this substitute motion was we went to the uh, forum a couple weeks ago on artificial turf. And as some other people said, uh, there were both sides and they weren't talking to each other. And I think you've heard similar things tonight by some of the speakers before us. And we felt there needed to be a committee appointed by town meeting that would report back to town meeting that would be a fair and balanced committee of stakeholders. So we, as town meeting members, as the elected representatives of the residents of this town, would know what to do when a proposal comes before us. We changed what we think should be the composition of the committee to make it fair and balanced. Jean, can you just hold on a second? We're a couple of slides behind up on the screen. Could you go forward two slides, please? No, back one. Next one. Back. So oh, se yeah, no. seven voting members, one appointed by the Conservation Commission, one appointed by the Park and Recreation Commission, one appointed by the Capital Planning Committee, because whatever we do is going to cost money, should be in the Capital Plan, one appointed by Envision Arlington, one by the Director of Health and Human Services, or she can do it herself, a town meeting member appointed by the moderator, and a town member, a town resident, excuse me, appointed by uh, the select board, and two non-voting members who can bring information and help the committee, the town's environmental planner, conservation agent, 
and the town's recreation director. We think this is a comprehensive group and is able to get this job done. And what we liked about this committee was um, that they are on a committee and they have to talk to each other and they have to share information versus what we saw the other night, which was they were talking ac across each other. Um, it really it was a debate. It was the same thing as the January 5th, 2023 uh meeting between CONCOM and Park and Rec. Next slide, please. We're running out of time. Okay, yeah, we're, yeah. Uh, let's see, what are we doing? Oh, yeah, so, um, but this is what's, um, so it's a great committee because it's, it really is a fair group of all the stakeholders, but in addition to that, as you can see from this slide, we have certain requirements for the committee members. They can't have any conflict of interest. They uh, can have, um, been testified at a court or administrative hearing either for artificial turf or against it. They can't work for a business that is in, is in the artificial turf business or has been involved in construction of an artificial turf field They're, or not being a member of a trade group that is involved with artificial turf. And that way, I think, we'll be able to get people who really are on the committee to look at the science and all the other relevant factors and make a fair and balanced decision. So we think this is the best committee both for the composition and because it's the only one that has these conflict of interest rules for yeah. the committee. Committee responsibilities, artificial turf review and report, health, safety, environmental impacts, mitigation, which is everything that some of the other people talked about. Should it be crumb rubber? Should it be Brock fill? You know, how do you deal with it? And a comparison of natural and artificial fields compared. Report findings and recommendations at least 30 days before annual meeting a year from now or earlier if the report's ready. So if something comes a year from now, we're set. And then um, the moratorium, the next slide, please. Um, the next slide. And I think we're just going to get to why, because we're almost out of time. Again, the main reason for the com composition of the committee is so that people can talk together instead of at each other and arguing and it being really tense and horrible, Next which is slide. what we've seen so far. Next slide. It, that's, that's the yeah, why. We're out of time. And, uh, and, oh, and that was just one more slide. I personally had never seen artificial turf. I went to the Arlington Catholic Field a couple of days ago. And okay, in the, we have to wrap this up. The first, uh, the first X you see looks nice and white from a distance. The second one, if you walk up close, you see it's totally covered with, with, with rubber. It, it, it's unbelievable. Okay. It's okay. Like, okay. So, so okay. Thank, thank you very right much. Aside. Thank you very much, and we appreciate your voting for our substitute motion. Thanks. Thank so we, we now have all the, the motions pending in front of us. And just to help visualize this, it's like we have one large, if you'll just indulge me for just a moment, and then we'll get to debate. Uh, it, we have one large platter, which is the main motion. On top of that large platter, we have two large plates, which are the two substitute motions. One of those large plates is the Malofschik substitute motion plate, which has six small plates, which is the Sixth Amendment stacked on top of that. And so we have to vote our, that is not described anywhere in this book. Um, <laughs> But that's how we're going to do it. I won't tell anyone if you don't, and we can now start debate. So let me go to the speaker queue now, and I'll take Mr. Goldsmith. Are we scrolled to the top of the uh, – uh, Mr. Helmuth? Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Pooler? Yeah, Mr. Pooler speak. Is about an update from today? Okay. Mr. Weinstein? Okay, I understand. I'll I'll make determinations. I'll make the determinations of scope. I'm aware. Okay, Mr. Weinstein, I'm aware of the concern, and uh, and Ms. Mr. Pooler does not. Mr. Pooler does not have a handset to request to enter into the speaker queue with the town meeting members. I will allow Mr. Pooler to speak, and I will be watching close um, watch over the scope. Mr. Pooler. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sandy Pooler, uh, town manager. Um, I found my town meeting button today, so I hope that uh, that will help everything go smoothly and quickly. 
A couple of people have made reference to uh, the statement from Belmont Hill, but some people also asked me about it earlier today in town meeting, so I just want to make sure that it's clear to everybody that we received a written notice today from Belmont Hill School uh, saying that uh, it is pulling out of funding any work at Poets Corner um, and that um, what had been proposed was to have Belmont Hill build a turf field there that could be used by Belmont Hill and by the town. So that is off the table. I would also just like to say, as I have said from the very beginning, since uh, Ms. Malofchek first offered her um, amendment, that I hope that the town meeting supports the select board recommendation of no action. If you feel like voting for a lot of amendments, that I would Hold hope. On, Mr. Weinstein, you have a point of order? I, un I understand, Mr. Weinstein, I understand the concern. You raised this earlier with me in private. I understood it then, and I understand it the same now. Mr. Pooler, please proceed within scope. Thank you. I have uh, opposed this for many of the reasons that Mr. Dennis uh, outlined. One, uh, I think a moratorium is a... Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Pooler, I want to point out that it's not a time for... I'm not, I'm not offering you this, this position ahead of the speaker queue for, uh, for debate on the amendments, uh, but if you had an, an update to offer that was relevant to this discussion. Well, I guess I would then ask the question, as the employed town manager of the town, who does get to push a button to speak, when would town meeting like to hear from the town manager on this issue? Uh, it is... Hold on, hold on, Mr. Weinstein, please. No, no more outbursts here. The answer to your question, Mr. Pooler, is that you may respond to questions that town meeting members may have on this topic. That is uh, an answer I appreciate getting. Not sure that it makes sense, but thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now take Mr. Goldsmith. Gary Goldsmith, Precinct 11. Um, I'm a little nervous. I speak from the vast experience of two and a half weeks as a uh, town meeting member. And uh, thank you uh, to my fellow members for working to make uh, the best clearly thought out decisions. Uh, I thank the uh, moderator for taking on a challenging task. I thank the parents of children uh, for uh, doing what they think is best in their children's interest and the environmentalists trying to do the right thing for the world that those children will inherit. Um, this is a debate about artists of turf inextricably connected with Poets Corner. And I find myself wondering if we're not making short-term thinking uh, and weighing that over wise decision-making. Uh, uh, let's look at the options here. Belmont Hill desperately wants more playing fields, today's events aside. Um, and they are willing to pay big money uh, to make that happen because they obviously don't have another good alternative to turn to uh, uh, other than this one. The Archdiocese understandably wants to generate sorely needed revenue um, and ostensibly will immediately sell their land to the highest bidder. Uh, but even though Arlington has a hot real estate market, um, I wonder how attractive a poorly capped landfill will be to developers and will they be willing to take on the cost and the risk of puncturing an unreliable cap? And how many homeowners, no matter how desperate they may be to buy a home in Arlington, which they should, um, are going to cough a big bucks to uh, buy a house on a sketchy site with potential health risks? Um, I think Arlington may have the stronger hand in this card game. Um, if we can resolve the issues in a timely manner. And with that in mind, I support the Benson Stamp substitute motion, which offers a clear pathway to a wise and timely decision. I think that both Belmont Hill and the Archdiocese, despite today's uh, events, are likely to work with us if there's a clear endpoint in sight. 
Um, they have confidence that their artificial turf option uh, will work, and they likely believe that they will get the field that they want, perhaps after a bit of a wait. And how long will that be? The Benson Stamp Substitute motion calls for a decision by the 2024 town meeting or earlier, if that can be achieved, perhaps at the special town meeting in the fall. Um, yes, our kids need more places to play, but will they think we did the right thing in 20 years if they have illnesses and injury uh, due to short-term thinking on our part? Um, I have a number of un unanswered questions about the alternatives that have been discussed. Is the entire site going to be recapped uh, to 2023 standards? What if the FDA or the CDC concludes that turf actually does have serious health risks and we're stuck with a field that nobody wants to play on and we will be on the hook for paying for uh, recycling the artificial turf in 10 years, perhaps when it's considered toxic waste? Um, how expensive will that be? And will the town meeting members of that time think that we made a good decision? Uh, or were we the last ones to buy into a problem? Uh, my point is that we are the governing body for Arlington. We are its legislature. We are the adults in the room. We should be choosing the best long-term decision for the town. That really is the focus of what we're deciding upon. I think the Benson Stamps uh, substitute motion uh, addresses that. Uh, I support it. I encourage you to vote for it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Goldsmith. Let's take Mr. Weinstein next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. Uh, I just first want to apologize for my outburst. This has been a very stressful process uh, to get to this night. But I'm uh, grateful. The meeting, the meeting does sincerely appreciate that. Thing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and I'm also grateful for all the folks who have stepped up and offered amendments and substitute motions for this. Um, I think it's a worthwhile conversation to have. Um, I'm one of the four proponents, main proponents, of the Malofchik substitute motion. And I'd just like to uh, say a few words about a few of the amendments that have been offered. And the first one, I'd like to talk about is the Vakil Amendment. Um, he was the first one to speak this evening of these. If anything, it's interesting because Sanjay's amendment makes the case for why we actually need a study committee. This amendment that he offers doesn't address the presence of what's called precursor chemicals that are in artificial turf and can chemically bond into P uh, PFAS. We've learned this from discussions with scientists that we've talked about and toxicologists. The, uh, st the testing that he mentions, EPA 537, is a method uh, he recommends, but it only detects a fraction of the PFAS in artificial turf. And he mentions the California and European standards, uh, but they hold no legal or regulatory weight in Massachusetts. And the industry phrase that he uses in his amendment PFAS free is actually nowhere near free of PFAS. But assume for a minute that you could get PFAS free turf. You'd still be choosing, if you chose artificial turf, the destruction of oxygen producing green space, Greenland ecosystem that you're covering, and habitat. Uh, you'd also be installing a heat island in an area of uh, Arlington near the Poets Corner uh, region that is already a, uh, a heat uh, island. And an EPA-defined impervious surface, which is what artificial turf is. And it will add about 27,000 gallons of stormwater per acre per inch of rainfall to already a flood-prone area over an uncapped waste site. PFAS, by the way, even though you may get small exposures each time you encounter it and are exposed to it, is something called bioaccumulative. So small exposures build up in the body to eventually become major problems for you. They cause cancer and other problems. And even if new artificial turf exposes you to very small amounts of PFAS and other toxins, over time, the PFAS and the artificial turf itself gets trampled on ground up and pounded into a powdery substance that then when you play on it uh, or run on it or roll in it, 
gets thrown up into the air. It gets inhaled, it gets into the mouth, it gets ingested, and it can also get absorbed through the body through abrasions, which kids have when they're playing sports. In any event, for all these reasons, I'm asking you to reject uh, the Vakil Amendment based simply on the fact that, as it's written, we simply don't know what we're going to be voting for. The Pagliasati Amendment uh, isn't controversial in my mind. If you think that all members in our uh, uh, Milofchik uh, substitute motion should be enabled to vote, please vote for the Pagliasati Amendment. That would make the three town employees who are currently non-voting members in the Milofchik substitute motion voters. And that would perceptibly and probably make it much more acceptable to a lot of people and maybe make it uh, more unbiased. Um, the Dennis Amendment, the first one, while it pretends to make the study committee more neutral, it takes away one important democratic freedom that was pretty much glossed over here that most committees have, and that's the ability to choose their own chair. Instead, the Dennis Amendment, number one, imposes a chair from the top as an appointee of the town moderator. Now, I have nothing against the town moderator, but in this regard, this amendment is rather autocratic and not in keeping with our historic and democratic traditions of allowing a committee, a study committee or any other committee, to elect its chair, or maybe even co-chairs, or maybe even a rotating chairs, but certainly not a chair that's appointed from above. Dennis Amendment number two expands the scope of the study committee to include best practices in the use of artificial turf. That's fine. But it fails to extend the same scope to natural grass fields. In my opinion, this is going to result in a skewing of the study committee to focus on something that really needs to be focused on, or to, to divert the focus onto something that really needs to be focused on, which is scientific information on the nature of artificial turf and whether it's safe uh, for us to use. If the town decides in the end to use more artificial turf, there would be plenty of time to study best practices. But as it's written right now, the Dennis Amendment number two changes the committee's focus, in my opinion, and distracts it, or would distract it, from researching whether artificial turf is safe to use in town. So after all is said and done, I still believe that the Malofchek substitute motion, um, the original substitute motion, is our best choice if we're to have a thorough, rational, and scientific assessment of whether or not our town should continue to use artificial turf on our playing field. So I urge you to vote yes on Malofchik substitute motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weinstein. Let's take uh, Ms. Bergman next. I hadn't been called autocratic before. I thought it would sting more. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Robin Bergman, Precinct 12. I'm not going to talk about the science and the specific amendments and other substitute motions since Jordan just did. As one of the proponents, one of the small committee that worked on this, I will try to explain to you why I decided to work on this warrant article and substitute motion and why it's so important to me. To quote a letter from the Connecticut Examiner this week, artificial turf fields, it's personal. In doing some climate-oriented work last year, artificial turf kept coming up. I started to go to webinars with scientists and read up on the subject. I had followed the DuPont Teflon scandal and exposés. I had noticed the PFOA scandal with plastic water bottles and was suspicious when everything was suddenly PFOA free. I had not put it all together until I listened to the scientists. These chemicals are all related as a class of chemicals, yet they have rarely been regulated and when they have, it has been one by one. And when uh, well, sorry, I lost my place here. Um, yeah. And when all individual chemicals are regulated, industry tweaks something in the chemical makeup and creates a new one. So now that new one is unregulated and free to be used. 
There are now somewhere between 12,000 to 14,000 PFAS chemicals. No one is exactly sure how many, and the number continues to grow. This is why many scientists now want them to be regulated as a class. I came of age during a time when better living through chemistry and the future is plastics were the slogans of the day. No one thought of any unintended consequences. When I was in high school, I was mystified and horrified when one by one, mothers of my friends started dying from breast cancer. There was a cluster of cancer in my neighborhood. Some of us originally thought we were immune to it because our houses were uphill from what then became known as a Superfund site. Then my sister's best friend, who lived two doors away, died of childhood bone marrow cancer before she was nine. Fast forward, and my mother fought cancer five times and didn't make it on that fifth one. I, too, had a lumpectomy and have been told I am at high future risk. And so are most of my friends. I can count only a few friends who have not had some form of cancer. Instead of meeting for lunch at a restaurant, it's become frequent to meet for lunch instead at the MGH cafeteria. I have lost too many friends from cancer, including one a week ago. Definition of Superfund site. Locations polluted with hazardous materials and waste. There were heavy metals and all kinds of other toxins in that Superfund site, and I now know there were also PFAS chemicals there, just as in artificial turf. And some 50 years later, the site is still in litigation after many proposed projects from housing to an Amazon warehouse have all been canceled because of continuing cleanup safety and liability issues. Artificial turf fields are creating toxic sites as well as leaching materials into the air, land, and water. Those of us working on the moratorium have sent you materials and articles about the current science. Artificial turf has multiple toxins, including heavy metals, PFAS, microplastics. New research comes out daily. For example, last week, articles about some of these chemicals broaching the blood-brain barrier within two hours. Remember, there are no safe levels of PFAS and no safe levels of lead, among other toxins. In 2015, the girls' soccer team in Washington State had a cluster of cancer cases among goalies. Recently, Philly, the Phillies reported a cluster of rain, rare brain cancer among ball players. Examples like this continue to come up. It's clear to me that PFAS and artificial turf are the new asbestos, the new tobacco, the new climate science denial. It seems we have not yet learned lessons from these examples. Why would we, in Arlington, ban plastic bags, ban plastic water bottles, endorse a new campaign to outlaw plastics, create new energy plans to get off fossil fuels, only to install a plastic field that is 40,000 pounds of plastic carpet, the equivalence of two to four million plastic bags just in the top layer of artificial turf alone. To quote, but take some liberties from that Connecticut letter again to make it more relatable to Arlington. I am disappointed and puzzled. Why are my friends and colleagues all fervent advocates for addressing the climate crisis on one hand, voting for removing green space and replacing it with plastic fields on the other hand. How can we, as part of the leadership in our town, promote new initiatives banning plastics to combat, combat global warming while signing off at the same time on yet another heat island in town already lacking sufficient green space? Why am I compelled as a member of Arlington Town Meeting to help formulate, discuss, and pass a policy that would place a temporary moratorium on artificial turf fields with a study committee when my compatriots don't see the urgency or the dangers? Maybe it's my lived experience. Maybe my personal story can sway some of your opinions. I ask you for a yes vote to support the Malofchek substitute motion and a no vote on the other motions and amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergman. Let's take Mr. Moore next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. We are seeing a moment in our history of understanding of these chemicals that looks like a lot of other times in science. It's confusing. 
We have scientists promoted by one side, scientists promoted by the other side, and I think the reason for that is this is how science goes. There are times when things aren't super clear. There are times when we think we see a, a problem coming, we don't know how bad it is, we don't know if there's a way around it. Um, and I think those things will become more clear over time. We have in front of us a veritable gauntlet, or maybe feast, Mr. Moderator, of, <laughs> of uh, substitute motions. Smorgasbord. <laughs> Smorgasbord, I'll go with that, um, of substitute motions. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the side dishes of amendments uh, surrounding the Malofchik substitute. Um, one thing that's, and I think we've heard really good things from the people who propose those things, and I thank them for their work in doing so. One thing I'd like to understand better is what happens if we take the select board's proposal uh, and vote no action on Article 12? What actions does the town plan to take in that case? Okay. Mr. Helmuth or Mr. Pooler? Sandy Pooler, town manager. It would be my intention, if this uh, no action is voted, to appoint a committee to look at the turf issues. I believe further study is important. I believe that the forum we had the other night answered some important questions, but also brought up other questions. So I would appoint a committee made up of members of the Conservation Commission, Board of Health, Parks and Recreation Commission, resident appointed by the select board, a resident appointed by the school committee, a resident appointed by the manager, and a resident appointed by the moderator. I would ask this committee to look at the composition of fields, uh, including the use of various components of the underlying structure, the grass blades, the infield, and other materials used to construct artificial fields. I would uh, ask it to look at the testing standards. Many people have talked tonight about what kind of tests there are, and I think certainly any kind of field that might be built in Arlington should pass rigorous tests. I would look at the environmental impacts of all playing fields, grass and artificial turf fields, including the release of chemicals from artificial turf fields, the possibility of reducing or eliminating such releases through the use of alternative materials, the use of chemicals on grass fields. Uh, we use a lot of chemicals on grass fields now and other related environmental issues. The health issues related to playing on fields, including temperature issues, exposure to chemicals, exposure to biological ha hazards, and injury issues. The recreation playing time on artificial turf fields, the capacity of grass fields to meet the demands for usage, and the life cycle costs of artificial and turf fields, including installation, maintenance, and disposal. Also, the feasibility of making current grass fields organic. I would ask this committee to make a report by its findings, I would suggest by January 1st, 2024, so there'd be time in case there'd be other warrant articles to propose for the 2024 town meeting. Um, I do this because I think people have raised some very serious issues. I have some very serious questions about turf fields, and I do think it is important to continue to look at this. So if, that, if the town meeting would vote that way, that would be my next step. Thank you. I think that's uh, a sign that things are working. Uh, if you're supporting fields, you've been heard. If you think artificial, artificial turf is a terrible thing, you've also been heard. Uh, and I like the manager's proposal because it puts together a committee involving citizens along with some of the other committees we already have in town uh, that are working on these issues. For instance, the Conservation Commission and I believe you included the uh, Recreation Commission as well, or the whatever we call them, Recreation people. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so I think the most straightforward path forward here is to take the Select Board's recommendation of no action, not because uh, I'm saying that everything that people have brought up is, uh, is not important, but because the government has hurt us, and there's a sensible path forward here that involves all of the organizations in our government that already exist and brings those together with, with uh, other folks to come up with a solution. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moore. We'll take Mr. Hurd next. Point of order. Andy Greenspawn, uh, Precinct 5, thank you. Uh, quick three motion questions. Is the, one, is the Benson Stamps 
Um, substitute motion dividable between A and B. If so, does someone have to make an official motion for that? And three, would they have to make a motion before we vote to terminate debate? That's a great question. See, that's a point of order. Um, it's about procedure. <laughs> Given the sequence that I laid out that I shared ahead of time with everybody, um, we would be pretty deep into debate before we know whether the main motion is divisible or not. And because of that, there won't be an opportunity at that point to have a speaker queue to debate or to make motions such as division. In that case, I would be inclined to divide the question in the interest of the meeting, which is my discretion as moderator. Um, and in this case, I feel that that would apply. So if we get to a point where we end up with a main motion that is susceptible of division, then I would be inclined, because the meeting wouldn't be able to have the opportunity to move to divide it, that I would, I would, um, I would take that step myself. Okay. But there are many outcomes where we get to a main motion which is simply not divisible. Okay. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Hurd, Precinct 18. It's the first time I've got to say that. I don't want to repeat what Ms. Helma said as, as re in regards to the select board report. Um, I do assume everyone watches all of our meetings and saw everything that was said at the hearings. But I do want to just come up and reiterate just a couple points that I made then and make a couple more points. To me, in, as a select board member, town meeting member, resident, I am always baffled by the amazing work that Arlington does in the areas of conservation, the fight at climate resiliency. And I certainly understand where the proponents are coming from on this. I come to this as part of the town administration, as a parent of two boys that get an awful lot of use on town fields. And I look at this as the proponents had mentioned, this pending legislation in the state legislature in Massachusetts right now on artificial turf fields. To me, this is a state issue for many reasons that the state has the resources to look at artificial turf fields, to bring the right experts in, and to make a very informed decision on the future of artificial turf fields in the state of, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It also, on a state level, no pun intended, levels the playing field for our athletes. And I know that there are a lot of concerns, and they're valid concerns. I don't want to devalue the concerns of people that, of the proponents or individuals that want to vote in favor of a moratorium. But to me, there's been a, a devaluing of the importance of adequate playing fields for our children. And this, of all the, the the articles that we've passed in recent years, whether it's the bottle ban, the plastic bags, whatever it is that I've supported, in those situations where burdening mainly adults, this is a burden on our children and you're taking away an incredible resource for our children, which is adequate playing fields for all the sports. You have a joint letter from the Arlington Baseball Club, Arlington Soccer Club, and Arlington Lacrosse Club, which for anyone that's involved in local sports knows it's very hard for those three organizations to come together on anything <laughs> relative to playing fields. And I say that in jest, but the reason is we don't have enough. There is a lot of demand for our playing fields. And because I've gone with my boys, I've woken up on a Saturday and said, hey, let's go hit some balls. We've driven to seven fields before, and every one of them was occupied. We do not have enough playing fields. This year, at least five or six games have been canceled so far. We've only played two or three games because of our playing fields. Poets Corner, if, you, if it rains, the standard is two days after the rains. If it rains on Sunday, Monday closed, Tuesday closed, you can play on Wednesday. And even on Wednesday, you're going to go and you're going to have to push water out of the, out of the 
I, I think it's in scope, Mr. Warden, uh, out of the batter's box in order for them to be able to play. So to come in at, and impose a uh, moratorium on, the, on new potential playing fields is just not fair to our children that are playing on these fields. And even with the news today, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have some new potential project that's going to come into play within the time frame voted on the moratorium. So with that, I would urge that you vote yes on Mr. Dennis's amendment, but as he mentioned, vote no on the main article. And with that, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to invite a town resident to speak for, with the rest of my time. Okay, you have about two minutes and 10 seconds. Yes, and it's someone that the town, I think, owes a great deal of latitude, gratitude to, for, to Mr. Phil Lasker. Yeah. And he is a resident of Arlington, correct? Uh, yes. Name and address, please. Phil Lasker, 1 Claremont Court, Chair of the Park and Recreation Commission. Okay. Thank you. The Park and Recreation Commission is devastated by the recent news that Belmont Hill School has withdrawn from the Poets' Corner project. Unfortunately, their financial situation has changed and their appetite for a lengthy and contentious permitting process has diminished. Our position as a commission has not changed. We oppose any moratorium, prohibition, or ban on synthetic turf. We believe, based on independent, scientific, peer-reviewed studies and the imp input from our experts, that synthetic turf is safe. Organically managed natural turf fields are not the answer to solving our field space and quality needs. Poets Corner is still a great location to explore the use of synthetic turf. The community has expressed the desire to have additional field space, less cancellations, improved field conditions, and safer playing surfaces. The way to accomplish this is with synthetic turf. Hundreds of volunteers spent countless hours on this mission. We would like to thank them for their overwhelming support, especially the user groups who really got our message out. Our commission will continue to work hard to bring their vision to reality. We would like to thank the Poets' Corner neighborhood who were actively engaged in the process over the course of three public meetings and several years about the project and provided valuable feedback. Okay, time is running out soon. Just finish up, please. We would like to thank the Belmont Hill School and the Archdiocese of Boston for this opportunity and hope that we can work together in the future. The town has had a long-standing, mutually beneficial relationship with these parties that will continue for years to come. Finally, we would like to thank Joe Conley, Director of Recreation, for his continued commitment to the town. His passion and dedication are unmatched. For anyone interested in more information about synthetic turf, we will be posting a document on our website as a follow-up to the turf forum held last week. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's take Mr. Tremblay next. Ed Trembley, Precinct 19. Mr. Moderator, I had a, um, a little experience not too, uh, a little while ago. I, I almost got involved in um, picking up a uh, artificial turf field. It, I think it was, uh, my, uh, my, it was a couple of years ago, so my, I'm getting old and my memory gets a little hazy. But uh, the upshot picking up was... Picking like you bought one or you physically lifted one? Well, I'm getting to that. Okay. Um, I think it was uh, um, there. I just forgot the name of the town, uh, Weston or uh, Sudbury, somewhere out, uh, somewhere out there. They they bought a brand new uh, um, artificial turf field that was less than a year old, and it rained some, and uh, the water wa ran across the field a little bit and washed the crumb rubber out of it, and then the field floated away. So um, 
I, I just wanted to bring that to the to the meeting's attention because we've been talking about um, chemicals and all this other stuff, but we haven't talked about the natural process of having your fuel float away if it's if it's artificial. Um, this is this a true story? And uh, yeah, because because I almost had to go pick up the chrome rubber. Um, and since we've been talking about Poa's Corner, I'll bring up something different here. Um, I would really like to see the town buy Poets Corner and make playing fields out of it, but with natural well, turf. Okay, so, so, so the, the, the purchase of land is not really within the scope. Well, I, I understand that. But the, but the use of, uh, of the land, um, whether it's got artificial turf on it or not, has, does have to do with what I'm going to say. Because I would like to see the town have that and put natural turf on it so that they could use it for a snow dump should we get a winter like we had not that long ago or a place to stash. Um, it, is this coming around to the use of salt on the road? No. By any chance? No, salt, salt, yeah. comes up in the, uh, salt comes up in the uh, DPW budget. Okay. Um, um, anyways, as a snow dump or a place to stash uh, vegetation, uh, should we have another microburst? It, generates a lot of it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Tremblay. Uh, I think Ms. Kelleher. It is 11.01. Uh, okay, uh, we, before I recognize a motion to adjourn, um, let's see, do we have any notices of reconsideration for the Minuteman 44, for the, for the one article that we voted tonight, we have a notice of reconsideration. Uh, okay, so do we now have any motions to adjourn? We have a second? Okay, okay all those in favor of adjourning, say yes. yes. All those opposed? Okay, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. We are adjourned. <laughs>